with almost 70% of the infrastructure yet to be built in cities to meet the needs of the population at its current growth rate. It is also imperative to foster partnerships between multiple relevant stakeholders, such as between central, state and city governments, along with the private sector, to develop resilient, inclusive and affordable housing in cities. The real question is that when we talk about sustainable and affordable in the way of the house, is it a perfect mixture, a mixture of which वो जो अफोर्डेब वो जो सस्टेनेबल हाउसिंग है वो एक समुदाय तक लिमिटेड ना रहे वो सब लोगों तक पहुंचे ताकि सब लोग इसका लाभ उठा पाए और वाकई में हम लोग ऐसी जगह पर रह पाए जो अपने आप में संतुलित है बैलेंस्ड है और सस्टेनेबल ensuring uh, the dignity of transgender person uh, facilitating access for persons with disabilities or looking at ways in which we can lessen the hardship faced by migrant labor this can only be done when all such stakeholders are involved right from the design stage and when they are ensured seats at the decision making table when we speak about sustainable and affordable housing what i see around what i observe is that there is so much focus on building houses for everyone the so much focus on putting bricks together but is there focus on building lives together this whole thing of community living shared spaces is there focus on that that's something that i really want to see change in how we design homes for people around us with all buildings required to be net zero carbon by 2050 to meet the goals of the paris agreement the demand for smart buildings is only increasing One of the basic requirements of a smart city to sustain itself is housing. Without housing, sustenance and further growth of a smart city will be limited. The future smart cities will require a good amount of affordable housing to cater to the large middle and lower income demographic. This is where the smart city mission and affordable housing converge to mutually benefit each other and further the goal of development. How can this be enabled wherein sustainable architecture can marry affordable housing? be inspired affordable and sustainable housing towards a smart design architecture rupali gupte and bijoy ramachandran in conversation with suparna bhalla rupali gupte is an architect and urbanist based in mumbai she is a co-founder of and professor at the school of environment and architecture and a partner at bard studio she has recently been a senior research fellow at the university of brighton Her work involves research on a contemporary South Asian architecture and urbanism with a focus on housing and urban form, tactical spatial practices and the role of gender in shaping habitation. Her work often crosses disciplinary boundaries and takes different forms: writings, drawings, mixed media works, installations, curation, conversations, walks and spatial interventions. Her works have been shown at the 56th Venice Art Biennale. The 10th Sao Paulo Biennale of Art and Architecture, Seoul Biennale of Art and Architecture and galleries and museums such as MACBA Barcelona. Architect and urban designer Bijoy Ramachandran is the co-founding partner with Sunita Kondur at 100 Hands, a multidisciplinary design studio based in Bengaluru established in 2003. Having worked on a wide variety of projects ranging from cafe interiors to apartment buildings and institutions, the studio's design approach is rooted in focusing on the urban context through the medium of scale, character, spatial and visual impact and the remaking of the public domain. 100 Hands has won multiple awards which include an official selection for the project South Exhibition at the Leone di Pietra at the Venice Biennale 2006. Suparna Bhalla is the principal architect at Abaxial New Delhi. This award-winning thought practice goes beyond the boundaries of architecture and urbanism into the realm of design research and cultural innovation. She graduated from the School of Planning and Architecture New Delhi and holds a master's degree in architectural design from the University of California Berkeley. Her recent works include Ashoka University Sonipat, the World Trade Center at Greater Noida, Chandigarh and CBD Noida housing projects in Gurgaon and Faridabad. 
She is on the board of the Dastakari Hat Samiti and has designed their exhibitions at Paris, UNESCO, Cairo, Singapore, New Delhi and Mumbai. The idea of affordable housing in India has always been both daunting and compelling, primarily due to the sheer numbers. It's a well-known statistic that we will need close to 25 million new units of housing by the year 2030. This is due to the rapid urbanization we see in our cities and the subsequent employment that it generates. Over 80% of the new housing projects launched in the year 2020 were in the affordable segment. And post-pandemic, this has only grown because 31% of the urban demographic that lived in rentals now wants a roof over their heads. In the design industry, it's a well-known fact that the crucible of design for housing, in, especially in the recent years, has always been the outcome driven by policy, economics, land laws, bylaws, basically all statistics. So what happens to the human element, to scale, art, culture, basically the proponents of living that make for society and community. The purpose of this discussion is to direct design's attention back to its roots, you know, that moved away from, redu you know, reducing a home to a shelter. On how do we integrate or reintroduce the key ingredients that make for livability, connecting the inhabitant to the habitat, whether it's environmental or urban, making spaces, not just for life, but for life that is actually worth living. Housing in India, just like the rest of the world, has traditionally stemmed from socialist ideals. Ironically, in all recent you know, offerings of housing that we see in India you know, in the last few years, we see a paucity of the human element, of anything that has to do with the social. It's not enough to build boxes and meet standards and bylaws, uh, just enough to put lodge people, you know, inside these little units. Housing has to fulfill the ideal of life. Alvar Aalto, in his famous, you know, thesis on housing and design, wrote about the idea of play in humanizing spaces. The idea was that play must integrate into itself, into design, in function, in elements. In housing, and in the affordable housing segment, we see all this has been put aside. We've just, you know, put it aside in the name of economics. But that need not happen. I mean, today, uh, the affordable segment in our country extends itself to slums and what is called the unauthorized sex, you know, settlements that we see in our cities uh, growing, you know, everywhere in our chawls, in our bastis. So as architects, you know, I would like to ask you that in your experience, uh, do you think this human element is vital? And how can the affordable segment of housing actually reintroduce these connections that can be enhanced by design? Yeah, no, in fact, uh, as, as part of this preparation, you know, there was an amazing exhibition uh, sometime back that Rahul Kaivan and Ranjit Hoskote put together called The State of Housing. And that, of course, pointed exactly in the direction that you sort of, uh, you know, introduced this, this session with the idea that, you know, these incredible numbers, I mean, they said it was 20 million in 2022, that was the ambition. They've got around 150,000 built now, but they will meet 2022 uh, uh, housing for all, you know, the grand scheme that's currently the sort of buzzword. Um, but how do you, I mean, you know, this led me then to Korea's wonderful essay from the from the 80s, I think, called Disaggregating the Numbers. And it's basically the uh, the challenge when you look at a number like that, 20 million houses, that the first reaction when you have this kind of a number in front of you is to try and bring that down to scale, to try and get one unit designed and then do that 20, 20 million times. You know, this is this is the, the way you could do it. And, and Korea talks about, he gives an example of, of food. And he said, if you thought about food like that, where you had to feed, I don't know, in, in Bangalore, maybe 8 million people, would you think of it like that, that you have to prepare one meal and then and then spread it out across 
you know have maybe four central kitchens and then make food for you know 8 million people and you don't think like that i mean it's disaggregated there are many agencies involved in in handling you know food uh, apart from of course the restaurants and various kitchens and things like that so housing also i mean when you think of it in in a way that is disaggregating that is it, it isn't looking at the 20 million number but it is looking a lot more specifically at at smaller communities and in fact before the 1960s before you know the big state housing agencies or hadco even in 1970 there are a lot of the housing examples that we look at you know as as examples belapur or you know even the gujarat fertilizer housing that though she did etc these were built by smaller agencies for smaller groups of people taking in particular conditions into account and designing for very particular situations and that's been lost in this conversation about the 20 million homes that we have forgotten exactly what you started with we forgotten that these are homes for particular kinds of communities in particular places uh and with a certain kind of agency all all you know of of for the of these age, of these communities and so how do you how do you how do you break this down so that they're they're comprehensible they're smaller and and the agencies that are working on these are located sort of close to the ground and working with these communities it's it's a it's a mind numbing sort of problem but korea's you know charge was basically to try and disaggregate to look at it in smaller pieces rather than at these at these grand scales which then lead to kind of faceless and and uh, homogeneous sort of solutions so actually um some of our own studies and uh, you know again speaking of the sheer numbers some of our own studies have shown that uh and speaking from maharashtra we've had a pretty robust regime of housing policies you know in the last 30 years in spite of that the gap between the demand and the supply of housing is absurd you know it, i mean just to kind of uh, put a perspective on that it will take with the present uh you know at the current rate that you are we are providing housing it will take 100 years to close that gap okay so that's the absurdity of the the numbers that we have on the other hand some of our own studies you know very close field based studies of uh, you know in in mumbai have shown that some of the housing that we speak about that comes from various delivery mechanisms you know they come from self built housing they come from you know small contractor kind of built housing um and you know some of them are actually much more creative than you know the the new developments that come from standardized ways of living and, and what we've been advocating then is to kind of look at the idea of repair and retrofit you know what does it mean that to repair and retrofit some of these spaces to make them habitable you know livable and then there are ways in which and there are series of examples actually which you know often don't get uh, quoted and known so for example there was this uh, very interesting study where we saw that uh, there was you know the lower level municipal uh, government you know staff actually got into one of the self built settlements and managed to build a kind of infrastructure where they had you know toilets kind of laid in such a way that people had individual toilets and slowly people upgraded their homes and you know and they were actually nice spaces to live in you know so i think there have to be many more ways in which we start engaging and i think architects have not dealt with this idea of of repair and retrofit enough because there is a huge creative space in 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 kind of really looking at what people have also been doing for themselves and you know taking that to another level and so that's something that we've been advocating how do you increase the transactional capacities of spaces uh, in you know in creative ways um so i think there's 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 a lot to be said about you know to really kind of look at what people have been doing but take that a next to another level so i think that's where we come from no i think uh, the you know you use the, you use the word transactional which is something that you know uh, you've been advocating for a long time that uh, you know the idea of settling it's something that you've always uh, you know pushed and you've said look uh, there is a process in which people come and they settle and they occupy space and then they change space and they transform space and in each of these transformations you uh, imagine a kind of transaction that happens a negotiation if you may you know if one may so like we have large sections in our cities like slums and you know unauthorized as they say housing or whatever you want to call it sometimes it is called urban village 
in delhi settings you know we have something called lal dora in land which does where uh, normal mcd laws and bylaws don't apply now these are very vital spaces in our cities because that's where the uh, sort of the workforce of the city actually manages to live simply because of the cost of land and living so do you uh, uh, you know ad- in these spaces do you, would you say that it is far better than to imagine them as uh, non existent and they should not be existing rather than that would you say like can we look at them as something where your transactional spaces can actually evolve if we are actually given the width and room to do that i mean do you think that that's a possibility absolutely i mean i i really feel that you know that's where that you know to also bridge uh, with what i've been saying before that is something that will really kind of allow you to bridge that gap that absurd gap that we have you know and so you kind of open up delivery systems and and i think that's where like we've had so many in i mean i just kind of speaking of the case of mumbai bijoy spoke about uh, you know the artist village uh, there is there has been a site and services scheme in mumbai in charkop so in some ways where people were provided not housing you know but they were provided kind of you know both shell and infrastructure or site and and infrastructure and people were able to you know in some ways work with their own resources and build things by themselves so, so if you had to give an example of how this is like how would you say like what do you mean exactly by trans- transactional space i mean i'm talking now you know like for the larger audience if if they had to understand it what would you how would you sort yeah. of exemplify it yeah so i'll just i can i'll give you an example of say um a, a chawl in mumbai okay that what happens with it is um you, you know there is i mean i don't have slides now here in front of me but i think if it would be just easier to kind of describe it okay so for example uh, a a chawl building in I, if you understand that it's it's basically it's a housing type that came out of there were two kind of historical uh, timelines in mumbai from where it came up one was a kind of trading uh, uh, typology another one came from industrial labor and basically these are two this is a tenement which has basically two rooms one up one after the other one is generally a kitchen space one is more a multi purpose space uh, but what is interesting is the configuration so you have a long corridor along which these tenements are uh, strung along and often there are uh, you know shared toilets but what is what we found is interesting is that Uh, often the tenement itself is a porous tenement you know so you can actually uh, you know it, uh, participate with the neighbors in the front at the back often there are bridges that connect uh, these settlements so you find a lot of people spending a lot of time outdoors you know where where the bridges in some ways become the living room of the place and what that does is that in some ways it increases what we under, we call transactions in terms of and transactions are defined as many things their kinship relationships their forms of security because one is watching out for another uh, sometimes these are they are also money because in some ways these are you know at the lower levels you where you are able to interact with the city and and also exchange goods across so an urban form provides these transactional capacities okay so i and there was a very interesting example where we saw this old uh, family you know this old gentleman and his wife were living in this room they were this old gentleman was bedridden uh, but they were able to live in that place because the house was a porous entity they would have you know people kind of walking in and out of their house waving it out to them and in the absence of social security something that we have in our country it's the urban form that stands for it you know and that's what we mean by transactional capacity and what happens in something which is redeveloped from here and this is a case that you see in mumbai often an old housing typology like that will be redeveloped and invariably turns into these towers okay now when it turns into the towers generally you will have these older these tenements uh, you know older tenants living on the lower floors and the the above floors become subsidy housing which is you know sold in the open market by developers you know that's how it subsidizes the bottom but though there is no eviction you have people are provided housing and sometimes it's called free housing so you feel like you're doing a favor to people but invariably life gets disrupted you know so a that you know when a tower happens like this up to seven stories you'll have parking you know so completely disrupts the walkability of that neighborhood you have people living in these towers 
with absolutely no kind of transactions with your neighbors you're now locked into your homes so nobody's really watching out for each other and your of course the the longer run your maintenance charges will increase so much that it becomes unaffordable right so you will sell out and go so there is a soft eviction that happens in that case so that's what we mean that if you if you think of urban form and we're not saying you know keep things as it is things may dilapidate you know the chawl may not kind of exist but how do architects learn from this this kind of speciality and try and design for this increasing the the transactional capacity rather than reducing it okay that's so, the yeah so like that's really correct because in fact that's the whole point now you know we have uh, so many examples from the rest of the world i mean like uh, you know uh, there's a design of the shakuji apartments which was done by the sana architects where you know they actually connected vertically and horizontally in tokyo so the vertical does work and they managed to connect it with the adjacent structures and then create community spaces so we have the bajak ingels group that designed the mountain that actually has gardens you know in front of the building so the whole building has become a landscape rather than just seeing it as uh, various homes so like this there are several examples bijoy if i had to ask you do you think these possibilities exist in this country and if so how would we do it how would we build the new sort of i won't say new but the future idiom of housing in india how do you imagine it well just to continue with what uh, rupali was saying i mean the the as an architect you know when you get a commission and and you're given a particular site to deal with you mine that for opportunities no you look at you look at the conditions that you're confronted with and you figure out ways in which to make places for well being you know i mean that's at the core of it what we're trying to do and you you try to efficiently use resources you maximize the potential of the site like the chawls for instance that we spoke about these are opportunities that of course the building frame itself offers you but then they're also invented over time that you you appropriate space you create uh you know avenues for exchange etc which a lot of the newer frameworks for housing don't allow you you know they they don't have that in between what rahul calls the thresholds you know these places where you can engage with others etc but i think that the the core is if there's if there's uh if there are smaller numbers to tackle and if there are creative like architects involved in in some of these housing delivery systems or not not only architects but if there is a there is a conscientious effort in in trying to make places for uh you know to to be livable then you you invent ways uh there was a wonderful speaker a few years ago at the z axis conference you know i forget her name now but she worked with the uh with one of the housing you know slum redevelopment housing agencies and she showed projects over the course of in mumbai she showed projects over the course of i don't know a number of years and and these were very very slightly improved every time they did a new project that they were trying again and again and again with these small moves to improve the quality of the shared space between these housing units some of them you know were so tight because of their density requirements because of the numbers number of people who had to be housed that she was fighting this good fight you know trying to create uh places that people then could share and use for whatever else you know their occupation or to meet friends etc so some of this of course is 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 tough to do but one has to sort of get in in there and and try and fix these uh, these conditions but i'm saying that it's also a creative response that you know when you look at the large number you're kind of overwhelmed uh, examples that come to mind of course you've already named sana but you know like aravena's project this is something that you know yeah. is is similar to what uh, what uh, Rupali spoke about that you give a half a house you know that you you make sure that they are in a place where they are close to their livelihoods and and so the land is really expensive because that's usually the excuse that you shunt them out far away there's no access to infrastructure no access for transport to get to places of work so try and get them so that they're close to where they can work they can find work and that means sometimes that the property is very expensive but then you don't build the whole house for them at least that's the chilean model right you build half a half a project you build maybe a half the house and you provide site you know services and then the rest of it they figure out ways to to do you know to do it over time that when they get the money then they pack up and close up and then inhabit you know the bigger house so it's kind of incremental but self built and that's a that's a good model i mean though she did it years ago with aranya where he made a you know kit of parts sites and services a mix of different kinds of house types 
so real community you know not a ghetto for instance you know a place where so basically was... you're saying that okay there's no sort of okay let's go and design this new kind of housing and like you know make this uh uh sort of new vocabulary and you know get it all fixed you're saying no it has to be slow the transformation has to be incremental it has to be seen over time and it has to be weighed is that the new way actually that we need to do things because in in effectively effectively that's a new way we haven't done that yet our whole in fact, in fact i would, I would say that's the old way that's exactly. the old uh, you know the old way and the okay, new the way old, is the sort of uh, the old old way, way. Yeah. Yeah. and the new way is this kind of you know let's fix everything with one solution and let's try and you know do it uh, on mass for everybody and that has its pitfalls i mean we've seen that abroad and in india yeah i mean actually it is a problem this whole speed of building i mean everybody is uh, you know worried uh, and the, this whole approach that we erase i mean corbusier did it right mm-hmm. i mean it was his way you just say okay let's erase and begin all new and we be disconnected with anything that we were there so now we are saying no we should connect we are saying no the okay the old old way which is now should be the new new way should be to connect and should be to uh, reach out through whether it's uh, through you know art through culture uh, anything that makes for uh, identity of a place it could be like you said occupation it could be anything you know that connects people to each other in some social way so Rupali this question comes to you because you know you work with a place like Khoj uh, which had a lot of um, work they did a lot of work in the city especially in Delhi with art and they used art as a connector within the city i mean ndmc delhi also uh, used uh, you know art as something that you know uh, actually was put on the walls of what was old housing and it actually created this entire walk and place a sense of place actually within the city which did not exist i mean delhi was supposed to have an urban master plan i mean i'm telling you because i'm in delhi i it were for art but we still haven't seen it um cities even like or paris dc they all have it even uh, wood you know like i said a place like in the back of uh, melbourne called wodonga somebody once sent me a, a thing on wodonga and i was very curious and it also has an art master plan for public art now do you think there are art being one small way i'm sure there are many tools do you think these are effective tools these are something that can engage uh, people who are not part of that housing also to engage with that housing do you think this is something that we should pursue in something in the future so yeah i mean art is 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 very very important to our lives and i mean for, for our own practice one foot is always an art um but i would sort of caution that often art gets seen as painting spaces you know so you would see somebody go into a neighborhood and paint it and say you know this is artistic and i think there's a little bit more to the, to it than that you know and so i in some ways i think i would answer it in two ways uh one is to kind of you know we see yeah, in the, the last conversation that you had we talked talk about speed but i think one of the bains is also the standardization you know we we kind of when in providing new housing you land up standardizing and when you standardize you're also standardizing lives you know and what is interesting and that's why it's important for a for a design process to also have one year on the field you know that you start seeing that people actually live very interesting creative lives how do you bring that into an artistic way of thinking of life and living you know and i'll just again give you an example we were you know in one of the self built settlements uh, visiting the safia base begum chol and you didn't know whose house it was you know you visited one person's house and then somebody else called you to somebody else's house you know so this whole idea that the house was really not a kind of property space but it was a space which people had themselves you know created as a space of of kind of celebration of life and living you know and i think that there's an artistic endeavor there how do we kind of think of that as a way of life and living rather than sort of painting spaces and so continuing that kind of way of thinking that is one sort of way i would answer your question the other way i would answer your question is again art you know it 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 ignites minds you know it and so in some ways really kind of thinking of ways in which you build infrastructures 
in cities that are you know that, that are able to kind of you know create a post educational space for example we have very few libraries we have very few spaces that people can go to and mind you today is a time of autodidacts you know knowledge is very close to us all you need is to provide access imagine young minds you know you have smaller spaces you know community spaces that are able to ignite people's minds provide the agency to kind of you know create an artistic endeavor for themselves to be able to kind of you know participate in a world of knowledge building you know i think that is an artistic process and i can just give you two small examples you know for this before we kind of stop this uh, conversation there was you know we recently upgraded a small community space in a resettlement colony in manpur okay it was again a, a money that came from some art project that you know it was talked i mean it basically had a very loose uh, idea of of the public realm we said you know if the public realm is so limited why don't we build the infrastructure for a public realm you know and so we upgraded a kind of small dilapidated shed that was there but that space really kind of became an open script for so many young people to come and you know engage in in artistic pursuits you know and they are already there at the brink of it right because i like i said everybody is autodidacts everybody is an autodidact today they have access to internet and you know we just provided wifi there and was a space which also kind of you know had multiple scales within it it was a small library on the on the loft there was a large multi purpose space there was you know a garden outside you know all of that so that in some ways became the infrastructure for young people to in some ways push themselves you know so i think and just to again just a small third point from this also connected to housing that often what we land up doing is we conflate house and home you know because house we we try to provide the house as a self contained unit which has everything and then you have to develop you know depend on developers to provide it because the government has no money blah blah you know but instead if you kind of look at the idea of the home as being an extended space you know where city becomes home neighborhood becomes home so you may have a very small space inside your house but you have access to all this infrastructure you know which which you kind of build your lives with outside the home and that's where a lot of you know the government can intervene a lot of other people to, can intervene to extend the idea of house you know to the idea of home so i think that that's where the artistic pursuits lie because that's a structural way of thinking of art rather than a you know painted logic of thinking of art so yeah what rupali said at the end I, i just wanted to augment that i mean the the challenge with uh, housing right now is the idea that you think of it only in terms of the unit you know the 30 square meter unit this magic unit which if you sort it out and so there is you know rurki is doing research into that unit type or you know there's iit doing a unit type and that unit type then becomes the gold standard because you can build it for whatever 5 lakhs or something and then that you replicate you know 50000 or whatever number of times and that's housing uh when in fact just like in architecture in fact when the client gives you a program you're trying to find the stuff that's between the program you know <laughs> the stuff that's in between that sort of making like khan calls you know the society of rooms you're trying to find that in between stuff and and i think housing really successful housing like the chawls that rupali mentioned is the stuff that's outside of the unit so they may be we may be missing a, you we may be missing the forest for the trees when we say that you know it's the unit 30 square meters and if i solved that and got that down to a certain number then that would solve housing you know yeah i agree and i, I think it's always the interstitial spaces you know we keep forgetting yeah. the ones which are negative are more important than the ones that are positive <laughs> but uh, like as an architect you know as somebody who if you given an opportunity and you say okay what would be these spaces what would they be i mean like i'm asking you from the point of view i know it's simple to say it's a street or to simple to say it's uh, socially connecting but if we had to physically you know sort of explain what could be these spaces please well, there's there. a there's a wonderful set of reports that uh, years ago that mcgill university produced I, you know it all of you know it is called you know how the other half builds and and uh, this is i think the precursor to the aranya scheme you know so what they did was uh, with a bunch of researchers and students they went out into the slums that were there you know in indore and uh, they they documented it's like the uh, the newford standards for indore you know like 
what kind of space do you need to make baskets so what time type of space do you need to make papad you know or what are the activities that the kids you know where are they playing gali cricket or you know where are they doing uh, you know gilli danda you know all these what what and and there are dimensions for all of this right it's a it's a standard it's a planning standards and it's documenting all of that stuff that happens that isn't sleeping and eating you know in addition to sleeping and eating there's all of this other stuff that's going on that communities are involved in usually there are groups of maybe seven or eight women who congregate in some part of the and it's basically just standards of how much space do you need if you have four cows etc 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 that's what you know that's what makes housing right you have to figure out okay if i'm going to have these communities live in these places then i got to accommodate all of this which is like again like what rupali said the larger area of influence you know my home is my neighborhood my home is the city and my home is all of these other things that are apart from just living or sleeping and eating you know and and the unit the 30 square meter unit is just that you know it doesn't encompass all of these other things that then make viable communities yeah so it it could be anything and and that's why this idea of being close to the ground of serving the people who you are building the housing for or at least having a sense of you know who this community is goes a long way and so then you are talking about really specific in a way architectural solutions rather than the big grand national narrative of housing uh, policy you know Yeah. Okay. So you're saying basically the ground view and not the drone view, you know, just always well, it, keep it. It has to be a bit of both. I'm just saying that right now it's it comes at a great cost. This national policy, housing for all, PMAY, etc. It comes at this great cost where you've completely negated the value of what is what is specific and important right on the ground, you know, for these. But the, can these values be put in, like even post? Is it possible to? Well, if they like, disaggregate, like I was saying earlier, if they, if they, if there is a way for us to think about different ways in which the delivery happens, who is doing what at what level? You know, what is the scale at which someone is operating? It isn't twenty-five million. You know, it, it, you're talking about much more. Which is why I think the the nineteen sixties. You know, all of these, uh, you know, housing schemes that were done for state agencies. You know, particularly like the Gujarat Fertilizer Housing or whatever. Doshi did a whole bunch of them. Tanvinder Rai have a whole bunch of them. we look back on to all of those projects as the gold standard for housing and they are small communities you know small communities of people with their places to work their school you know it's a, it's it's a neighborhood that's one model and, and the other one that rupali said which is to look at the existing stock of housing and say how do i now intervene to fix and repair and and make it viable for communities to now use this fabric or, or the the built stuff that's already there suppose you had to give three basically just your top three ways of doing it and i'm i'm posing a really difficult question <laughs> this is the toughest one this sounds simple the, what would it be like if you had to speak to the next generation of people what would it be so if i can say uh, the th- things that i would really sort of focus on is one a field based education you know so not only from learning from precedents but kind of learning like i like you said you know with a year to the field so a really a kind of an embedded field based education second is really kind of a spatial and artistic thinking you know that comes from ways of starting to think of type typologies ways of life and living embedded in the configurations of space yeah and the third one is closely working with communities so you know you you kind of start then thinking of what is it that the that you can kind of work with communities and not for them or or sort of also against them in many ways so yeah i would be those are the my three field based education spatial and artistic thinking and closely working with communities the joy she has stolen some of yours so now you have to think <laughs> well i have very little to add to that i i was going to say uh, i was going to say variety identity and participation so variety is actually a uh, linking back to a knowledge of history and of precedent and i think uh, often times uh, in our, as an architect you think that your primary job is speculating but in fact it isn't speculating it isn't invention it's discovery so you're trying to understand what exists and maybe use that to then speculate so i think variety comes as a result of this knowledge of precedent the second is identity and i think as as an architectural education or or as a students of architecture and as a practitioner the notion of culture or the or the study of culture the idea of what makes culture you know this real sociological sort of uh, uh, you know 
grounded sociologically grounded education i think is also missing that we're we're somehow only talking about precedents in a vacuum we look at you know these case studies and we don't know what made these these examples the way they are and so culture and this notion of identity and to recognize you know what what the the tropes are and there's so much of literature to help help us and the third i think to take ex exactly what rupali said is the, is the notion of participation that somehow again in architecture schools we are taught somehow that we will then make the napkin sketch and this would be the great wonderful project that is sublime and and everything good and unfortunately the moment you step into private practice you understand that even as an architect without all of these social concerns that even doing a, a silly house or a, you know small project that you have to depend on others to come to something that is meaningful and important that the sublime comes through participation with others and 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 in housing more so than anything else you have to be willing to get in there in the trenches and sort of figure this out with others uh, uh, so yeah these would be the three three things and just to like quickly sum it up you're saying go local yeah keep your head down and mm -hmm. work hard at it it will be slow right don't do anything with this impetuousness that we all try to do like you said no napkin drawings and like rupali put it very closely observe and think before you start to build i mean these are they may sound like these things are very common and easy to do but we all know that this is the difficult part it's difficult to restrain difficult to hold back difficult to listen i mean at least i i i think that's the biggest problem in housing housing is not difficult to do it's actually difficult to just do right for people and innovation can change the world all we need is passion focus and a desire to help if you have an innovation please send it to us at whatever stage it is in our panel of experts will assess it and help propel it towards reality the sky is your limit don't wait mail us your idea or innovative thought at beinspired@teamworkarts.com at